In the third year of the 80s, things were pretty great. We were having fun by the sea. We were young, we were free, and our radios pleased us all greatly. News flash, people, it's April 1982. Time of life when one felt invincible, limitless in possibility, and that nothing would ever change. How wrong we were, but how rockin' the top 10 was. Come along for a new wave wild ride. Starting this week with the segment that just can't get enough. Hello and goodbye. And you into the top 10 this week are the young one himself, Cliff Richard, and his cover of the old doo wop at Daddy's Home, stepping in from 11 and destined for a short but melodious stay. And then the fresh face madcap new waivers Depeche Mode, before things got all dark and druggy, with the dancey just can't get enough, up from 7 to 13. Leaving the 10, our beloved former three-week number one Tainted Love by Soft Cell, down from 9 to 11, and to general cries of don't let the door hit you in the ass on your way out, Foreigner's number three hit Waiting for a Girl Like You, which slunk out from 10 to 12. Biggest hit entering the chart this week was Rick James's Super Freak, which wasn't much of a hit getting as high as 26, which is not like getting as high as Rick James, which is pretty gosh darn high. Biggest hit leaving the chart this week was the erstwhile number six, Tonight I'm Yours by that old smoothie, Rod Stewart, which spent the last of its 21 weeks on the chart this week. And the next number one hit coming in on May 9 was the historical epic of ancient Greece, Hate the Jet Black Trojan Sand by Darn Cool Overkill. Onto that one, if you will. At number 10 this week, down from 7 after a higher 4, is the excellent Homo Sapien by Peter Shelley. He formerly of the Mighty Buzzcocks. Produced by Human League producer Martin Rushent, this was only a hit in Australia and Canada, having been banned in Shelley's native England, for apparently containing explicit references to Achillean romance. I wouldn't know about that, but there's some damn good kraut rocky new wavery, and I'm pretty sure I have the 45 of this somewhere. Number 9 is Daddy's Home, a cover of Shep and the Limelighter's 1961 hit by Cliff Richard, which while making no higher than number 7 here, was a UK number 2 and a relatively rare US hit for him, making number 23. Following his big hit Wired for Sound, this made a fair job of following up and Cliff was still landing in the top 40 right up until the end of the century. In at number 8, it's that spunky little Aussie songbird Olivia Newton-John with her follow-up to the mega-hit Physical, which was the biggest hit in the US for the whole of the 1980s, Make a Move on Me. I always thought this one deserved a bit better than it got, managing no better than 8 for 3 weeks in the 10. Darker and twistier of melody, I always considered it amongst the first rank of her hits. Co-written and produced by John Farrer, who also wrote You're the One That I Want for her and John Travolta, one of the biggest selling singles of all time, Make a Move on Me performed relatively anemically, spending 15 weeks on the charts, the fewest of all the entries in this week's top 10. The follow-up landslide was pretty terrific too, and it had a totally mental video which featured the future Mr. ONJ, Matt Latanzi. 7 is British Bobster's Depeche Mode with their so far only top 10 hit in Australia, The Irresistible Just Can't Get Enough. A genuinely huge group almost anywhere else in the world, while they've hit the top 40 a handful of times here, they've only managed a solitary top 10 studio album as well, 1997's Ultra, as well as a Greatest Hits package. A band with a truly monumental backstory, drugs, death, superstardom, depravity, the whole bit. They remain a cult band here, albeit it's a large and very dedicated cult at that. This one got to number 4 and hung around the charts for 17 weeks. Number 6 are genuine one-hit wonders Quarter Flash with Harden My Heart. This is as good as it got for the Portland Oregonians, but it did spend a respectable 19 weeks on the chart with 7 of them in the top 10. The band's name apparently comes from the Australianism Quarter Flash Three Quarter Fool, which if they knew what it meant would realise that the term was probably applied in some kind of racial context and probably shouldn't have been the basis for a popular band name anyway. Those of you who love pointless meta-references in this series, and I love them anyway, this is the equal 297th biggest hit of the 451 records we've had so far by artists with just one solitary hit, which puts it on a par with entries like North to Alaska by Johnny Horton or Love Hurts by Nazareth. Number five is another one-hit wonder, Joey Scarberry, with Believe It or Not, theme song from the TV show Greatest American Hero. Did anybody watch this? Scarberry was a serial singer of TV themes, apparently, but this song is probably most famous nowadays for Jason Alexander's mangling of it on an episode of Seinfeld. 
apparently had to do a few takes of that because Alexander of course is a really good singer in real life and it's considered quite difficult for good singers to actually sing badly and convincingly badly on cue. An interesting thing about this record is it spent six months on the charts without making number one. Now 15 songs so far that we've had have managed that feat the longest being Space Invaders by Player One, which hung around for 33 weeks in 1980 and stopped at three. The most remarkable case of this, however, is the recent feature The More I See You by Peter Allen, which spent 28 weeks on the charts for a solitary week at number 10. Time for the trade-up where we look at records on the charts this week which never made the top 10 and which in any universe in which local record buyers weren't idiots would have. And there are some absolute bangers this week. Girls on Film, a monster by Duran Duran, which fell out of the top 40 hits this week to 45 and never got higher than number 11. This is Radio Clash, which I loved and still have in its limited edition sleeve somewhere around here, spent its solitary week at number 40 this week. On you, during their lifetime, they only hit the top 44 times with London Calling, which got to number 28, Rock the Casbah, which made number 3, and Should I Stay or Should I Go, which barely dented the top 40, being the other end. And they only had one top 20 album with London Calling. Calling. Earth, Wind and Fire, Supremely Smooth, Let's Groove. Another chapter in their remarkable history of reinvention shimmied its way as high as number 15 but could do no better. And Love Action by the Human League, which you would have bet your money on being a number one, made number 12. One of my favourite weird things in all music is in the middle where Phil Oakey loudly declares, Now this is Phil talking, I'm here to tell you. Like a hardcore Memphis soul man, and he's been one of my heroes ever since. Number four is old pineapple head himself, Rod Stewart, with the second single from his Tonight I'm Yours album, Young Turks, a flagrant rewrite of Chuck Berry's You Never Can Tell. Stewart was attempting to overhaul his sound here, departing from the disco silliness of his previous two albums and jumping on the new wave sound without, however, too significantly altering his band. It gave him a couple of top 10 singles, this one being the more successful getting into number three, but it didn't fare as well as his previous album Foolish Behaviour, despite on the whole having stronger set of songs. Beyond this, old Rod only had two solo top 10s ahead of him, but he still has a legion of fans out here at Can Can and does pack out arenas whenever he tours. Three is Shaken Stevens with another song of his that I have no recollection of whatsoever. Oh Julie. It's a sort of a boppy Tex-Mex Zydeco thing. It could have been replaced by anything on the trade up this week and the top 10 would have been better for it. This was to be his last top 10 hit out here, although he kept having smashes in the UK for another five years. And the guy had an epic run of hits on the Danish charts. 16 weeks on the charts, seven in these rarefied climbs for the summit right here of three. Into the top two with number two in the middle of a five week run at number two after slipping down from its solitary week at number one is Centerfold by the Jay Giles Band. This perennial party star has spent a whopping 24 weeks on the charts and is enjoying a new lease of life or a horrific zombie existence depending on your POV. Think it's for mobile phones, I'm not sure, let me know, but it would make sense I guess given that some phones fold in the center and they are useful for making homemade porn. Not that I would know anything about that. Facts of Interest Most expensive guitar ever which sold for over 6 million US dollars is the one played by Kurt Cobain on Nirvana's MTV Unplugged special. There are only 13 countries in Europe that have never changed their capital city. 99.9% .9 of all German shepherds are dogs. Those facts may save your life one day. If you ever need these facts to save your life, perhaps you need to rethink some of the choices you made that got you here. It's Val's Fantastic World of Facts. The biggest mover this week was Dirty Creatures from Split Ends' new album Time and Tide, which goes from 59 to 26. The dropper this week is former number 10, Shake It Up by The Cars, down from 23 to 32. No new records in the top 40 this week. In fact, the highest debutant on the whole charts is at 75, and it's the jam of the town called Malice. Here's a provocative question. Were the jam really that good, and why? The longest running hit on the charts this week is Urgent by Foreigner, which has now hung around for 32 weeks. In the USA, the number one was Joan Jett and the Blackhearts with their stonking cover of Arrow's I Love Rock and Roll. Glam rock diehard that I am, I gotta say, this version crushes the Arrows and all others. Seven weeks spent at number one. In the land of Johnny Rotten, the home of the absolute rubbish number one, they delivered again with Seven Tears by the Goombay Dance Band, which held on for three weeks. 
One was it with Germans and Cod Caribbean bands. I lasted about 20 seconds into listening to it before I thought it was just going to be a painful waste of time listening to the whole thing. It has no melody, just this numbing chant. But hey, my Britannical friends, it was your 85p and you are free to do with it what you wished. And seeing the Falkland Islands had just been invaded three days ago, you probably had other things on your mind. This time last year, the number one was the very groovy Adam and the Ants with Ant Music for the third of its five weeks on top. Next year, it'll be Joe Cocker and Jennifer Warnes with Up Where We Belong, the first of its two weeks, Up Where It Belonged. And the number one album this week is Moving Pictures, a band from Sydney that was Glenn Wheatley's next big thing after the Little River Band. I'd like to think they were named after the Rush record, but I don't think they could be that cool. This hung around for seven weeks on top before Cold Chisel knocked them off. <laughs> Well now, I am frequently criticised, or was frequently criticised back in the days when I could walk, no one can criticise me now because I'm disabled, and you apparently can't criticise disabled people, of living off my tall privilege, especially at gigs when girls would complain loudly that they couldn't see over me and could they please ride on my shoulders. I'm only six foot two, which is the right kind of tall, not too officially tall, but still able to look down on people who flex about being six foot tall. Anyway, here are some musicians who are surprisingly not quite that tall. Bono. Actually, no surprise here, Bono is a five foot five and a half, and he gets really pissy if you don't add the half. Tom York. No wonder he always sounds so miserable, not being able to get things off the top shelf and stuff. Five foot five. Bruno Mars, five foot five of solid funk. Billy Joel, needs a booster piano tool. Five foot five. Ronnie James Dio, five foot four, of which four foot eight was his balls. Britney Spears, five foot three of hot crazy mess. Paul Simon, five foot three, six inches shorter than Artie Garfunkel but much, much richer. Angus Young, five foot three. I'm sure the only reason Angry Anderson didn't get the gig in ACDC in 1980 was he's actually shorter than Angus. Brian Johnson is a towering five foot five. Ian Drury, five foot three. I always thought Ian Drury was a giant. I saw him in 1979 and I have no memory of him being diminutive. Prince, Five foot two. We all knew he was a little fella, but five foot two? Apparently one of the major causes of the hip pain that drove him to opioids was having to walk in stack heels for so many years. A lot of joy in the music world seemed to evaporate when Prince became unalive, when he went through a disalivement event. I'm not allowed to say the D word on YouTube anymore, apparently. Five foot two. Kylie Minogue. Five foot two. Don't nobody say nothing bad about Kylie. Just look how adorable she is in this film clip. Dolly Parton, four foot eleven. That's standing upright, and God only knows how much of that is wig. Well, that's one way to lower the bar on this channel. Let's see if we can't raise it again by introducing the number one single. And here to do it is that chimp from Uganda who the press loves to slander. I'm sorry, I haven't done this for a while, and I'm, I'm really out of practice. Monte, that's the nope, bar lowered even further. The number one single is What About Me by Moving Pictures, a song I truly loathe. And if you haven't heard it, I'm betting you soon will loathe it to yourself. In the third of its six weeks spent at number one, it's just everything I could possibly hate in a record rolled up into one big ball. But it's not the worst number one we've ever had. I think Kokomo by the Beach Boys is worse yet, and anything by 1927 is intolerable. But that's because these records are designed to cater to a preconceived market. What About Me is awful, but at least it's unselfconsciously awful. And the band knew it, and they rarely played it in concert. 12 weeks in the 10, 24 on the charts all up, and after Eye of the Tiger by Survivor, second biggest seller of the year. In 2004, Shannon Knoll, from whom I have already once had to go into hiding in order to escape his maniacal wrath due to comments on my channel, debuted at number one with an even more hysterically awful version of this already hysterically awful song. Well, there you have it. That's as close to how the cow ate the cabbage this week that I could possibly describe. And now I'm tired and need to lie down with the cool flannel and the becks. So, should the good Lord be a willin' and the creeks don't rise, I'll be back again with another episode in a week. Uh, 
hell, I'll be back when I get back. Ish.